All right, well, as we begin this morning, um, I'd ask you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 is where we'll be primarily looking today. And as you turn there, I'll say that there are, there are two weapons that Satan uses with great effectiveness on those who seek to serve God. Uh, there's a lot of other weapons as well, but these two primary ones that I'm going to talk about today are discouragement and depression. Now, sometimes those are triggered by working alone with nobody else to encourage. Sometimes it's triggered by toiling long and arduous hours unrecognized. Sometimes it's triggered by working in seeming obscurity and not seeing a whole lot of tangible results in our spiritual efforts. Dr. William Leslie was born January 12, 1868. He was saved as a young man. He moved to Chicago with his family in the year 1881. It was while he was there in Chicago that God began to impress upon his heart to be a missionary in a remote region of the Congo and Central Africa. He studied and he trained to be a pharmacist with the intent of using medicine as an inroad to missionary work. Now, inspired by another Baptist missionary, Adoniram Judson, he left North America as a missionary out of the Baptist church and settled in the Congo in the year 1899. He was there for a number of years, establishing, uh, just getting uh, integrated into the culture, and in 1912, he moved to an area and set up his base of operations in a city called Vanga, and he started his missionary work in that area, desiring to really reach into the primitive tribal peoples upriver in the jungle, uh, some of whom still practice cannibalism in those days. But Dr. Leslie spent 17 years in that pursuit. Of course, <clears throat> Satan had to interfere. And after a dispute and a falling out with one of the leaders of the foremost tribe that he was ministering to, he was asked to leave. Uh, that was the primary tribe that he was ministering to. That falling out with this leader caused him a lot of soul searching, and he felt like he'd fallen short of the work that God had called him to do. Um, in, in time, the two men were reconciled, but discouraged. William Leslie came back to Canada in 1929, where he died six years later, and died believing that much of his 30-year investment in the Congo had been a complete failure. What he will uh, never learn, uh, possibly until the judgment seat of Christ, was how effective his work really was. About 80 years later, in 2010, there was a team of Christian workers and missionaries who took a similar journey into what is now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They flew into Vanga, the same city that Leslie had worked in. They hiked the mile overland to the river, crossed the wide river and dug out canoes, and then they hiked 10 miles into the jungle to the first village, and they were totally unprepared for what they came across. They found a, a network of self-sustaining, reproducing churches. They were peppered throughout all the villages where Dr. Leslie had worked. Eight different villages uh, had their own gospel choir. Uh, they didn't have hymn books, but they had written their own hymns, and they would actually travel from village to village and have gospel music sing-offs uh, between the villagers. Uh, these missionaries discovered as they dug into the history there that in the late 1980s, about, again, 60 years after Dr. Leslie had left that area, the church in this first village that they came to actually got so large that the building, they actually looked at pictures of it this week, um, uh, it, the building itself could seat over a thousand people. And this was a very fairly primitive village. Um, but, it, but the church got so large with many people walking miles from surrounding villages to attend this church that a church planting movement was necessitated in the surrounding villages. Uh, and had spread to at least those eight villages and possibly beyond. Dr. Leslie, it was found out, um, had made it a practice to cross the river 
and spend a full month at a time traveling through the jungle. He was teaching the people how to read and write using the French Bible as their textbook. That's all that they had. Uh, he started the first organized educational system in the villages, and that had been perpetuated by subsequent generations. By the time that this discovery was made, the tribal people knew nothing at all of William Leslie except for his first name. It's all that they knew. <coughs> um, they knew his name was William. They knew that he was a Baptist missionary who went to the Congo in 1899 and had left in 1929. In the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, King Solomon writes the well-known statement that there is a time and a place for every purpose under the sun. He says there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to get and a time to lose. In, uh, in his consideration, Solomon shares about the various pursuits of people on this earth and the futility and the emptiness of trying to find meaning in all those temporary things. He considers how none of them really bring joy. None of them really bring satisfaction to people's hearts. At the end of the list of all those things that he talks about, he, uh, he, he says this. I'm just going to quote this to you, but listen to it. He says, I have seen the travail. Now, this is Solomon, who is um, stated to be uh, the wisest man. And the wisdom that God gave him was unsurpassed. And so other than Jesus Christ himself, when he walked the earth, Solomon is the wisest man that's ever lived. He says, I have seen the travail. That is the, uh, the agony that people engage in, which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Um, and then it says of God, it says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart. I love the wording of Scripture, and it's really a joy to study um, these words. When Solomon says that God has set the world in their heart, the word world means eternity. That's what it's talking about if you look it up. It is that which lasts far beyond this temporary world, and the mere existence and experiences that people live for here for a very short time. Any person, any of us, any other person that we talk to that slows down long enough to consider will recognize that we have um, been built in such a way that we will always pursue meaning. We need something to live for. We want our lives to have value. We want to leave a legacy or a lasting impression while we're here and after we're gone, because otherwise, what's the point of this existence? It's just a futile pursuit. You're born, you live, you die, and it passes on to the next generation, and it just goes on and on and on. What's the purpose of it all? If there's not some meaning uh, beyond just these temporal things that we see, God has built into us the need to have meaning, to have eternal lasting purpose. But as we begin to really um, comprehend that reality, what we can see is that the only way that we can have meaning in our lives or have permanent value is to be rightly related to God himself. That's the only way that it can happen. You know, every day uh, I see the frustrations of those who are trying to find meaning and value apart from God. Every day. I shared with you last week about my neighbor, Jim Dawson. Um, since 1952, he's homesteaded in the North Pole area. The, the uh, Dawson Road is named after him. He developed a, a good portion of the residential neighborhoods around my home. He's done very well for himself financially. He has a beautiful spread still as a 90-something-year-old of over 100 acres right next door to my house. He's enjoyed a very long life. And he's still relatively healthy and strong at his old age. But folks, he has no thought for eternity and no thought for God. So what does it really matter in the end what he's accomplished? He's going to die and he's going to pass out of this world if he doesn't come to know God. And it'll all be absolutely pointless. All over the world are people who have similar experiences, they've lived similar lives, they pursued all the vanity that the world has to offer, only to find misery and lack of lasting purpose. 
People take their lives as a result of it. They experience depression and discouragement as a result of it. But once in a while, it is a joy to come across a person who may have lived for all the wrong things, seeking meaning and value in all the wrong places, and then they met Christ, and they were converted, and what a change it brings for this world and for eternity. If you've been with us recently, you know that I've been preaching a series of messages on the life of Peter. It's been fun. Today we come to the last message in that series. I wanted to really finish this prior to our missions conference last Sunday, but God had other plans, I guess. And I, I realize now that it is very, very fitting that we would have that time of intensive focus together as a church on that highest priority before we came to this message today. We're going to be again in the book of 2 Peter, as I said, as we look at this last recorded writing from Peter's life. And as we do that, let's draw together some of the loose ends of his life and, and bring them together in closure and coherent focus today. Peter became a great man. You and I can also become great people of God. You know, we'll never fill Peter's exact role. He was a key part of the foundation of Jesus' church when it was first established. In the book of Revelation, Peter is predicted to have his name literally written or inscribed on one of the foundations of the New Jerusalem that God's people will be blessed to walk in someday. Uh, the Bible says in Revelation 21 that the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem has on them the 12 names of the apostles of the Lamb. You and I will never have that. But we can make a difference to others and to God forever. Our lives can have great eternal meaning. Our lives can have great eternal significance and value. Today I want to give you three reasons from the book of 2 Peter why Peter's life has eternal repercussions. Let's remember that he was just a common fisherman. He was nothing special. He was uneducated. He was no different than we are as far as his constitution was concerned. He was a sinner with the same kind of struggles. And yet the implications of his life go on forever. The eternal impact of our lives can continue forever as well. The first reason that Peter's life has eternal repercussions, folks, is because of what he believed. Notice in 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 16. For time's sake, all we can do is skip around this book a little bit and pick out some of the major themes. But 2 Peter 1 and verse 16, Peter said this, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Peter's saying this, we were on the mount when Jesus was glorified, when he was transfigured, and we literally heard the voice of God give this testimony regarding his Son. At that time, um, Peter understood more clearly than ever that he was in the company of God in the flesh. He believed in God incarnate. He believed in Jesus Christ. You know, I talk to people all the time who say that they wish for a miraculous revelation of God like Peter experienced. Just a few weeks ago, a young lady came to church and she said that very thing to me. If only I'd been there or could be there now, how different my life would be. I talked to another guy. Uh, if I could only be baptized in the Jordan River, what a life-changing experience that would be. <laughs> if I could only have the same experience that Peter had. Well, friends, the good news is that we have something that is just as good and better. Peter goes on to say 
in verse 19 that they didn't only get to see the miracle. They got to hear the audible voice of God the Father himself. And so it says in, in verse 19, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Great. But, he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Take this personally, friends. He says, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. You do really well if you pay attention to this today, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter believed in Christ. One of the reasons that he had his life has eternal repercussions, and we continue to feel the reverberations of his impact even today, was because of what he believed. He believed in Christ, who is called the Word of God. He also believed in the written word of God. He said here in this statement that the written word, what we have and possess right here, was even more sure, more certain, more substantial, more concrete than their physical experiences with Jesus was. That's really a remarkable statement, isn't it? It's amazing for an eyewitness to say something like that. We have an even more sure word, he says, that is the scriptures. Uh, and so Peter's telling us that my personal flesh and blood experience, because humans can be deceived and misled, that's even less certain than the words that were spoken by God's prophets. And you do really well, you're really smart, you're really wise, if you take heed until, he says, the day star arises. So he pictures this scene, and he talks about the darkness that's in people's lives and in their hearts and this, this emptiness and this vain pursuit that we talked about already from Solomon's writing. And so people are empty, and they don't have anything to live for, and, and they're full of darkness, and then um, the light comes, and it shines in, and it illuminates some things. A light shines into a dark place. And he says that that happens until the day star arises. You know, as long as the day star, by the way, you know what that is? That's the sun, all right? And so picture a dark night for just a minute. As long as the sun is not visible, you need an alternative light source. You need a headlamp, you need a flashlight, you need a lantern that's going to illuminate your path and, and allow you to be able to see some of the area around you. You can't see everything. It's not, going to, it's not going to illuminate the whole world. But when the sun comes up, the lantern is no longer necessary. It's overpowered by the sun, and it doesn't really do anything to illuminate at all at that point. All you're doing is just burning the battery, so you better turn the flashlight off. And so it's really a glorious thought here, folks. There will be a time do you realize this? When we won't need the Bible. When the, the day star returns. It's talking about when Jesus returns in his glory. And we're able to be physically in his presence again. But until that time, we have this sure word of prophecy. Peter had an everlasting impact because, what he, because of what he believed. Uh, friends, whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell is not determined by what you do. It's determined by what you believe. Whether your life will have an eternal impact is determined by what you believe. The Bible says very clearly that there is a great divide among humanity. Those who truly believe in Jesus Christ and understand him to be the Savior... God in the flesh, and they trust him personally and implicitly with their eternal souls. And on the other side of this great divide is those who don't, those who reject him. Jesus made this powerful statement to the ungodly Jewish leaders as he illustrated the difference between those that believe in him and those that don't believe in him. Listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. He says, the stone which the builders rejected. The same has become the head of the corner. All right? So he, he's giving another illustration, right? 
Um, the Bible likes to give us illustrations because we're pretty dense and it's hard for us to make the connection sometimes. So here it is, all right? It, he says, Jesus says that here you have the foundation. You have the, the foundation stone, the cornerstone. The builders, he's talking about uh, the leaders in the Jewish religion in the Old Testament. The builders rejected that stone. And it says that that stone that they rejected has become the head of the corner. It is the main foundation stone that's there. And Jesus went on and said, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. He's talking to the Jews. And given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. The kingdom of God, right? They're, they're going to bring forth the fruits of the kingdom of God. The Jewish people did not bring forth the fruits of the kingdom of God. They didn't believe in the right things. They rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected the Savior. And so the, the kingdom of God is taken. It's going to be given unto somebody that brings forth the fruits thereof. And then he says this, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. The illustration that Jesus was giving was that if we fall voluntarily upon that rock, Jesus Christ, and we are broken in humility, we can be saved. But if that rock has to fall upon us, then we will be ground into powder and destroyed in God's judgment. That's another way of saying that God will either be your savior or he will be your judge, depending on what you do with Christ. So Peter believed. And because he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and he believed in the surety of scripture, his life was changed and was able to have eternal repercussions. Secondly, it's not just because of what he believed, but also because of what he did. Now, I've already emphasized to everybody today that what you do has nothing to do with salvation. You're not going to work your way into, uh, into God's good graces by doing a bunch of what you perceive to be good stuff. What you believe means everything when it comes to coming to God for salvation. But after salvation, what you do makes all the difference in the eternal repercussions that your life can have. I don't have time to talk about all the things that Peter did in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, but you know what we've covered so far. He left everything and he followed Jesus Christ. He was bold in his service. He devoted his life to preaching. He testified and he witnessed about what he'd seen in Jesus' ministry. He was sensitive, though sometimes obtuse and biased in his thinking. He was sensitive still to taking the Gospel to the Samaritan people and to the Gentiles. As a result of all of those things, he had a great impact on the lives of many, many people. All of that has repercussions throughout all of eternity. Maybe in some um, way, even our existence here, having come to Jesus Christ, can be connected back to Peter. He was the first one that took the gospel to the Gentiles. Set the trend for that. There's a verse in the book of Revelation that says this. Listen to it. It says, here is the patience. And that word patience means steadfastness, constancy. Uh, it's the characteristic of a man who's not swerved in his deliberate purpose. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord, for their works do follow them. Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. The statement that's made there is so powerful. The work that we do for the Lord Jesus continues to impact generation to generation to generation. I want you to draw a logical conclusion with me today. When we die as believers, we don't immediately go and stand before the judgment seat of Christ, do we? That is a future event, and it won't occur until after um, all of human history has culminated in the end times. Why? Why is the judgment so far in the future? Why don't we just go and stand before God right uh, when we die? 
I believe, at least a part of it, is that it's because all the effects of our lives continue to impact others for good or for bad for many generations beyond us. Think about how serious this is now. I may not be the greatest orator or evangelist, but God could use me to lead one key person to Jesus Christ, who may be a great evangelist. Through that person, hundreds or thousands more could come to know Jesus Christ in the next generation. Those hundreds and thousands could marry and all raise godly children who in turn grow up to serve him. The trickle-down effect of that one person coming to Jesus Christ through my ministry could impact the world for Jesus Christ. On the other hand, if I fail to bring that one person to the Lord, think about the generational impact. It could be that none of those hundreds or thousands come to know the Lord. None of those families grow up to know Jesus Christ and those children aren't trained up to serve him. If I fail as a father and I don't lead one of my sons to Jesus, or if I fail to lead that one key person to Jesus because my life is wrapped up in selfishness, it's wrapped up in vain pursuits, it's wrapped up in career considerations or selfishness, all those hundreds or thousands could be eternally lost. And the negative impact of my life will have eternal repercussions in an evil way. What a scary thought. What a motivating thought. See, everything that you and I do has repercussions. And those repercussions are set up like dominoes. You ever set up a domino, you know, all those dominoes and set them up in a pattern so you can push the first one over and it just continues and knocks all the dominoes over? But we don't have the foresight to know how those dominoes are arranged when it comes to these eternal matters. And so um, there's somebody here like, uh, like Natasha Brandt, for example, who works with our little kids, right, in our, in our discipleship ministry. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to be involved with little kids sometimes. Um, their attention span is often very, very short. They can get on your nerves. Um, and, and I listen to the, their class sometimes and I think, man, how, did, how does she wrangle these kids and, and, uh, and still get the message of the Bible across so clearly? Um, she's got a real gift in that way. But she's faithfully serving in that critical ministry. And what she doesn't know but must try to be cognizant of is that in that class there are boys and girls who are going to grow up to become men and women. Mightily used of God, or God forbid, tremendous disappointments in God's service. Sometimes we lose sight of that when we're in the heat of the moment. That's why God calls us to faithfulness, and he calls us to realize the grave implications of our actions on eternity. There's more affected than we can possibly imagine on this side of the grave, folks. Remember what Revelation said, their works do follow them. Those who die in Christ, their works do follow them. And so Peter became a great man, and his life has eternal repercussions because of what he believed. And secondly, because of what he did. Thirdly, also, because of what he became. Now, one of the fascinating things to notice in this second epistle of Peter, written at the end of his life, is the thing that he emphasizes is the internal character of individuals because the work that God does in us on a personal level is even more important than the work that he does through us outwardly. It really is. You see, God's in the business of changing the human heart. God wants us to become Christ-like. He wants us to change from the inside out. He wants to change those deceitful and wicked hearts of ours. In fact, I'll tell you this. If, if you knew what was in the heart of the person who's sitting next to you, you'd move. You wouldn't even say, we are unspeakably corrupt. Notice what Peter says now in 2 Peter chapter 1. We go back towards the, end, the beginning of the chapter, verse 3. Now, this is what he leads in with. Look at the focal point of Peter's life. As an old man getting ready to die, he says in verse 3, according as his 
um, divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. We've already talked about what he believed. That's the word of God. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Then he says that you need to take that faith that's established through the promises of God, which we've talked about, and you need to add seven virtues to your faith. And these, notice, they increase in intensity as he goes on. They increase in dedication. As these are built one upon another, I would challenge you to look at them and see that they are uh, perhaps the clearest indicator of spiritual growth and maturity that takes place as God shapes a person. This begins, this list begins in verse 5, and I'll, I'll just list the virtues, which indicate so clearly the growth that God desires to bring into our lives. You know, hey, the, the study that we've been engaged in has been titled, Shaped by the Master's Hand. That's what we've been calling it. This is Peter and how he was shaped. Um, and we've seen how God took this rough cut piece of lumber called Peter and smoothed him until he was a useful man. Peter's reflecting back on that process at the end of his life, and he says this, giving, verse 5, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Um, faith, we understand, is trust in God's word, and so that is the foundational beginning point. So a person saved, they believe in God's promises, they believe in God's word, and then it says as a believer, add to your faith virtue. You know, that word virtue means moral excellence and integrity. That should be an, an automatic thing that comes into a person's life from corruption to purity now. And so add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. That is a deepening grasp of God's word and his truths. And to knowledge temperance. Temperance is self-control of the passions and the emotions. Isn't that wonderful that Peter learned that? And to temperance. Patience. Here's that word again. Perseverance or staying power. Patience or uh, to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. This is reverence toward God. It is God-likeness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. That's care for others. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Charity is, is love. It's it's a love that sacrificially seeks the other's highest good. Now, notice that all of those qualities, or of all those qualities that Peter lists that we just talked about, none of them are related to our personality directly. They certainly are not related to our abilities. Peter's saying that in our day and age, as God is working through your life in True North Baptist Church, what God is primarily interested in is the change of your character. As Peter continues his train of thought on in chapter 3, verse 10, he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We talk a lot about moving with urgency here in our church ministry, and this is why the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now let's just stop and think about it for just a minute here. Every new car, every new house, every bit of our clothing, everything that people have worked so hard for, everything that people have saved so hard for, everything that people have fought over, it's all going to be burned up and destroyed. And that's what uh, Peter's saying. He says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Peter's saying that the only thing that's going to survive the fiery, total destruction of planet Earth in the end is going to be the character of individuals. Human beings are going to live forever. What I'd like to do is to ask you to think about 
three lessons that flow out of these thoughts that we can take home with us. I told you that Peter believed the right things. He did the right things. And, um, and he became the right person. I want to summarize it all now by saying first that every person that lives has an eternal impact. Every single one. Even those who aren't Christians have eternal impact. In that case, it is an eternal impact for evil, not for good. Remember, every single person that you visit with after this service ends, every single person will be either an eternal tragedy or an eternal wonder of God's matchless grace. One or the other. The impact that you have, even if you think it may be negligible, that impact will go on throughout all of eternity. Every person whom you influence for good or for evil will live eternally and be impacted forever. Application number one, every person has eternal impact. Application number two, every Christian's life has a mixture of both evil and good in it. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter? We studied this before, back in Luke chapter 22. He warned Peter and he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. You see, what the Lord wants to do in our lives is to work within us so that eventually we have more wheat than we have chaff. Satan wanted to take Peter and prove that Peter was nothing but chaff. Jesus wanted to prove that Peter was part chaff and part wheat, and eventually the chaff would be blown away through maturity and through spiritual growth, and the wheat would remain. We're all a mixture of wheat and chaff, aren't we? There are things in my life that I wish I wouldn't have done. There are failures. There are sins that I've committed, and there have been sins in areas where I should have done things, and I didn't do them. All of us live with that mixture within our hearts as believers. But I want to impress on you that the things that are done for Christ go on eternally. Thank God that we can be forgiven of the evil things. But even there, we see repercussions that continue on, don't we? Particularly if we have wrongly influenced the lives of some people, every Christian is a mixture of wheat and chaff, that part that needs to be, uh, that, that's, uh, that's waste, that needs to be removed from the good wheat. But God's desire is that the chaff is blown away and that the wheat alone remains the third application. Only eternity will finally reveal the true nature of what we have invested our lives in. You see, God doesn't give us the privilege of foresight so that we can see the impact of our lives on this earth. Sometimes we see a little bit of it, but most of the repercussions continue forever and are hidden from us, at least up front. Hey, we are often so incredibly naive to the impact that we're having on others. Think of how detailed, think, think for a minute here with me, how detailed the judgment of God will eventually be. It's a sobering thing. Psalm 56 and verse 8 tells us that every tear that has fallen is noted in God's book. I can only assume that means that God's, keep, that God's keeping score of every tear that you and I cause to somebody. Every heartache, that's a sobering thought. God is the judge of every one of those. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 36, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. <laughs> Serious business. Revelation tells us that every person will stand before God's final judgment and God's books will be open for that judgment. There's at least a couple that are mentioned in Scripture by name. 
I imagine his word is going to be one of them. And those books are all going to be open for judgment, and there will be detailed documentation of people's lives that's laid out there and considered and weighed by God. When Jesus talked about how the hearts of people respond uh, respond to and apply his word, he summed it up by saying that God knows the inner counsel of every heart, and nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Those ought to be very sobering statements to every heart here today because they reflect the implications and the impact that we have on others that continue far beyond us. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16 also tells us that those who fear the Lord and think upon his name and talk of him together, it says, are written before God's throne in the book of remembrance. Mark chapter 9 and verse 41 tells us, for whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name because ye belong to Christ. Verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Um, sometimes I've had somebody run and get me a cup of cold water when I'm preaching or when I'm working around the church property here. I, I can say in all honesty that a sacrificial heart that is eager to serve the Lord, even in small areas like that, can take it to the bank that God is taking note. God sees. You see, we forget about um, we forget about all those things very easily. God remembers, and His accounting is detailed. The end product of much of what we do is hidden from us, and only eternity reveals it. And remember, it's not entirely what you do, but for whom you do it. That's really very, very important. No matter what your profession is, if you do it out of a motivation to serve Christ and you keep your affections aligned with God's real work for your life, which is sharing the gospel that can save people's souls, you have no less an opportunity to receive the rewards of God when you stand before him um, as preachers and missionaries and even people like the great apostle Peter, because God takes note. We may not see it. Others may not see or appreciate it. But if it's in keeping with the scope of God's word, that's so clearly laid out for his people, we can be assured that God sees and he's keeping track. Think of many people in our church ministry right now who are touching and shaping lives that God will do some great things through. Many of you may not have thought uh, before about the impact of your actions. As you um, rub off on and impact others uh, for Christ. No matter who you are, you have the capability and you have the responsibility and, and frankly, the inevitability to touch lives for the kingdom of God. You may or may not see it now, but in eternity it will be known for good or for bad. For a whole host of people who've been faithful to God throughout the years, and for many who need to be challenged to stay faithful and engaged in the Lord's service in future years. Only eternity will show how those dominoes were set up so that the effects of what we did in our prayers and our mentoring and our outreach and our yieldedness to God and our service to Him has eternal repercussions. I'm challenging you today to take heart be faithfully engaged in the work that God's given you to do. Don't get discouraged. Don't get disappointed. Don't get disillusioned, even if you don't see instant results. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ every single day, and your faithfulness will come back to be seen again. The effects will continue forever. God illustrated this to us through the life of the Apostle Peter. He can do it through us as well. According to history, Peter died, crucified upside down by his own request because at least history says that he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same position as his master, Jesus. You should know before we close in 2 Peter chapter 1 that he talks about that. He knows that he's about to die. 
He says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, Yea, I think it meet or appropriate, as long as I am in this tabernacle, still in the flesh, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. He's talking about John 21. We referenced it a few weeks ago when Jesus indicated that Peter would die on a cross. He says in verse 15 here in 2 Peter, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Little did Peter know that his influence did continue on after his decease, and it will continue on forever. So will yours. And so will mine. Remember that missionary couple that I talked about served the Lord so faithfully in the Congo? Dr. Leslie's goal was to spread Christianity. And yet after so many years, it seemed like he'd made so little an impact. They came back discouraged, thinking that they'd been failures after 30 years of service. They gave everything they had. They gave the best years of their lives. And they died not long after returning to Canada. Unknown to Leslie was the legacy that he had left behind. A church that he had planted in one village grew to over a thousand, 60 years after he left the country. Had to break up into church plants to other surrounding villages. A whole chain of self-perpetuating churches ensued. People who had continued to follow Leslie's example in teaching one another how to read and write so that they could stay in God's Word. They'd written their own hymnal or their own hymns so that they could praise God in song and had eight gospel choirs that would come together from those villages and sing songs of praise to Jesus Christ. Be assured that endeavors for the Lord will never go unnoticed by God or be forgotten or unrewarded. Scripture reminds us, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In another place in Hebrews, God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love, which ye have shown towards his name. Listen, God does not reward us according to what we see as tangible success but he rewards us according to what he sees as faithfulness. However, don't ever, ever, ever lose sight of the internal, the eternal impact of your life every moment of every day. Please, folks, please live a life that makes a difference for eternity. Let's pray. Father, today we give thanks for those who've gone before us, 